Hi, it's Hayden here, and you're very welcome along to another episode of Man in the Mirror. Now, Man in the Mirror is a podcast where each week I talk to a male guest and we discuss their morning and evening routines. We talk self-care, self-image, grooming, and what the guest really thinks about the man that looks back at him in the mirror. Now, this week, my guest is Vikan Arslanian, who has the intriguing title of re-founder of a brand called Commodity Fragrances. Now, um, you may have seen Commodity online or, or in store, and yeah, they have a real simplicity about them. It's an American brand um, that pioneered this new way of of talking about the, the kind of... The strength, I suppose, and in, in instead of talking about eau de parfum and eau de toilette, there's this scent space idea and there's three different um, scent spaces which are personal, expressive and bold. Now, Vikram will, will tell us much more about that during our chat, but um, it struck me that there's a real kind of simplicity and a kind of stripping away of some of the... The, the impenetrable and the difficult terminology, um, which is often French, um, taking that away from from fragrance, um, you know, very straightforward names to their different fragrances and this different way about thinking about the the concentration and and um, you know the, how bold these fragrances are. So really interesting to to hear from Vic and um, yeah, and you'll also hear how he, again in in the same sort of um, clear sighted way and uh, kind of stripping away the the mythology. He, there's a on the the commodity website. There's a whole kind of docu series, I suppose, of of how he took on the brand because he's uh, he's not the first owner of of commodity and how he took it on and kind of rebranded it. And you get to see behind the scenes, which I, I as a kind of fragrance fan, I found really, really interesting. So, um, yeah, he, he was a, a fascinating guest to have on. I think you're really going to enjoy this. It's Vikan Arslanian, who is the re-founder of Commodity Fragrances, talking to me, Hayden Williams, on Man in the Mirror. Let's go. Welcome along to Man in the Mirror. It's Hayden here. And Man in the Mirror is a place where each week I talk to my guests about self-care, grooming, uh, self-image, and what they think about the man that stares back at them in the mirror. Now, this week, I'm delighted to say I'm joined by Vikan Arslanian, who is has the, the very interesting title of re-founder of a fragrance brand called Commodity Fragrances. Um, hi, Vikan, how are you? Good. How are you, Aiden? I'm very well. Look, thank you for doing this, because I know you're on American time, and it's, it's earlier for you, a bit, a bit later on. Friday for us here in the UK. But um, commodities a brand that I've, I guess I've got more aware of over the last few years. But in that title of re-founder, it obviously suggests that you came to it further down in its in its kind of gestation. What 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 was the story with with taking on the brand of commodity? How did that come about? Um actually I think I'm three even 3.0, not even 2.0. So oh, the, are you? <laughs> I, I think so. So the brand actually started on Kickstarter in 2013. Right. And it was really the first uh, kind of digital brand, their first perfume brand to be born kind of on the internet as a, as a try at home, modern American kind of perfumery brand. Uh, the short story is that exceeded its expectations on Kickstarter, you know, launched afterwards. Some investors came and bought it, went into Sephora. Somebody, you know, somebody else bought it, kept going and kept yeah. growing and growing and growing. And it kind of was a victim of its success and it grew too fast, shut down, fell into our lap. I bought right. it. And so so that's why I'm saying I'm kind of re-founder number two, probably. Uh, yeah. It's been a really interesting story. So I hope I'm the last re-founder and I'll probably get rid of the re maybe next year. Yeah, well, That makes sense. But um, it, it feels like a really interesting time for the brand. And I've... I've watched some of the, for, for listeners who haven't seen the, the commodity website, there's a great section where Vic and, and the team, you kind of, kind of get this anatomy of a, of a brand really. And there's this behind the scenes of how Vic and came to take on the brand and, and then the journey along the way of, of bringing it back to market and, and uh, reformulating and, and um, rebranding, which is really important, I think, here because it has such a, to me anyway, a real clear sense of purpose there's a it's a it's a very direct brand and what what i love as well is it kind of strips away a lot of the the kind of formal and technical language and some of the you know the kind of french words that some people understand but we sh certainly shouldn't assume that everyone does and there's a really clear idea of how it works 
and who each fragrance is for. So they have very straightforward, descriptive names, such as milk, book, gold, paper, things like that. So you know what you're getting. But there's also this idea of the scent space. So it'd be great. Vikram would be far better than me in explaining how that that works. But but it's certainly stripped of all this idea of sillage and, and words that people find a bit complicated. So what, what was this idea of scent space and, and what will it mean to the consumer? Because- yeah, it's, um, it's a good question. So when we bought the brand, first of all, the, the, the part of the website that you're referring to is our docuseries, which, yes. yeah, which I started. So at, right after we bought the brand, I knew it was going to take about a year to kind of reboot the brand. Right. And so I thought, let me just kind of keep our our, the, com- the commodity community engaged. It wasn't really my community at that point. It was the existing community. Yeah. I said, let me just film kind of what's going on behind the scenes as we reboot so that they don't think that we're gone forever. We're still around. And really it was just meant to keep people informed, but it really turned out to be a really interesting kind of an awareness thing where new people started getting attracted to the brand and following the story and like, hey, what is this? This is really super interesting. So anyway, we filmed this docuseries that tracks how we bought it, how we received the inventory, how we made new fragrances, and just kind of a the behind the scene process of how to reboot a brand. And in that process, and, and let's also remember that COVID happened right after I bought it. So yes, yeah. it was like October of 2019. And then- I mean, perfect know, timing. You know, yeah, you know what happened after that. Yeah. So so in the middle of COVID, we're, we're reimagining this brand. And the brand is a Calm or the work on the brand is a culmination of, let's say, my career. I shouldn't say culmination, but is a result of what I've learned over the past 30 years. So yeah. just as a quick brief, I've been in the business forever, you know, my family, and, and I have a mature distribution business in the U.S., which I can get into later. But, yeah, yeah. but part of the reason why I like commodities so much was really its simplicity, its elemental nature, and really just editing as much as possible from a brand uh, while really keeping a maximum amount of its essence. Right. It's a hard, kind of like a hard thing yeah, to no, do. Yeah, I, I, like, I like it. <laughs> hard thing to do. Yeah. Um, and the sense space issue was, so a lot, a lot of side stories here. So I'm an architect by profession. I should say I studied architecture as a profession. I'm not right. an architect. But my wife is, my family is, you know, we're kind of surrounded in the creative world. And so I, th- I see things spatially. And so when, when we had this discussion locally about how strong should a fragrance be? Do people like strong fragrances or the parfum or the toilette? It's a fairly long and, you know, deep conversation. But over the years, this designation that people were used to, like eau de parfum, eau de toilette, eau de cologne, extrait, whatever, it started losing its... Um, viability because they're really based on percentages of oil. But yeah, but people yeah. start using more oil, less oil. And so it kind of got thrown out the window, the designation. So, you know, our theory was let's look at fragrance and its strength with how much space it occupies around you. Because there's some people that don't want to be smelled, for example. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. I'm one of them, let's say. I want to, I want to smell myself. I want to smell great. I want to love the way I smell, but I don't want to be forward with that. I don't want yeah. anybody else. And there's it's others. Not about, it's not about your fragrance sort of entering the room before Correct. you do and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes yeah. it is. And sometimes <laughs> it is. And so, and sometimes I do want that. I want someone to be like, who yeah. the heck was that? What the heck was you wearing? And what the heck's going on here? Right? Damn, he and smelled so, good. Yeah, exactly. And so, so we realized that's the space around you. Is it a small space? Is it near? Is it far? Is it medium? And so we decided to kind of throw away eau de toilette, eau de parfum, and so on and replace it with personal, expressive, and bold. And the personal fragrances are obviously things that are close to your skin. The expressives Mm. are just enough to express yourself. And the bold are, can you guess what the bold are? (laughs) They're bold. They're bold. (laughs) So um, that's Am I right in saying, Vikan, that um, all of the fragrances are available in all three of those different scent spaces? Yes. So all of the fragrances we kept, so we did discontinue some fragrances. All the ones we kept are in the scent space collection and every one of our fragrances available are available in three different concentrations, personal, expressive, and bold. I think it's so clever. And, it, and it's, as you say, it, it, it makes a lot more sense of that. And because, yeah, the, the world of colognes and parfums and extras gets very complicated. And as as you know, there there are some fragrances that are eau de toilette that actually might project more than a, a parfum. So it, it becomes a bit of a sort of nebulous term, doesn't it? So I think this is this is a really clear way of of 
doing it. Well, if, if I can just kind of make one last elaboration, what's really interesting is people ask, is this like a marketing tactic? And the proof that it's not a marketing tactic is that traditionally, and, and for anybody who's listening and is interested, traditionally an eau de toilette is about 10 to, let's say, 12 or 14% of oil. And yeah. an eau de parfum is 15 to 18, and then parfum is 18 to 25. That's the traditional, okay? So in our case, the middle of the road, right, the expressives are mm -hmm. 15 to 18%, okay? But our personal fragrances that you would imagine are going to have less oil actually are 22% are higher. They are a parfum concentration. So why is that, you may ask? Yeah. Go ahead. Ask why? It. Why? why is that? Why, why is that? So the reason is because we want long-lasting fragrances. And in these cases, we don't want them to project, but we still want them to last long. So we change the profile of our personal fragrances so that they don't jump off your skin too far, but the higher concentration keeps them on your skin a long time. And so this idea that we removed eau de toilette and eau de parfum, we really cannot call our personal fragrances eau de toilette. Although that's where they would fall traditionally, eau de toilette, eau de parfum, parfum. Ours is actually eau de, it's really like eau de parfum, eau de toilette, and then par it's really mixed up. And so there's a real reason why we threw out those terminologies. So I, th I find that one of the most interesting things of our brand, actually, that totally. personal fragrances are higher concentration than the expressive ones. And that idea that it will last longer, but sit really close to your skin, I think that's really, really compelling. Exactly. Yeah. I think also I'd like to, you, I mean, you mentioned it there about your your family's involvement in architecture and the fact that you trained. I just... Oh, it's funny, in, in doing the podcast and, and meeting people in the industry, it seems to be a career path and, and a sort of sector that crops up quite a lot. And I suppose, I, I just find it fascinating that, that um, you know, these links between, maybe it's links that I'm sort of artificially creating, but th that idea of structure and, and the sort of the marrying of the technical and the creative, it, I, I can totally see why architects and our people who are interested in architecture understand fragrance and structure as well. I mean, it, did you feel like it was a sort of happy accident that you fell into fragrance after doing your training or did, did some of the sort of disciplines and ideas make sense from your, from your architecture training? What most people don't know is that making perfume is a real art form. Yeah. So let's start there. It's, it's super technical and it's an art form. Therefore, there's a real link between all the different disciplines of arts, right? You could be a sculptor, a musician, painter, an architect, and so on. You're really dealing with very similar variables, right? So if you look at music, they're called notes. If you look mm. at fragrances, they're called notes and accords yeah. and so on and so forth. I'm sure people have heard this a million times, but the terminologies are all the same. So how you create, how you're inspired and so on. Now, in my case, by the way, you can throw all that out because I'm not really a perfumer. And that's really important to say, because if I claim that I am, I'm actually doing a disrespect to yes. the perfumers. And I'm not. I'm, in fact, I don't think it's my strong point, believe it or not, the fragrance specific part of it. You know, I got into the business, I mean, we're getting into deep psychology here, but mostly for kind of family reasons and so on. You know, people yeah. do things for, for, yeah. for, for family businesses. You, um, you say your, were your family in the fragrance industry? So my father was doing, so let's, Let's go back to my business here. So in the US, I'm a distributor of artistic perfume. So yes. we represent about 25 of, I think, the best artistic niche perfumery in the world. Yeah. Um, and that's what we do. We really try to stay away from the commercial fragrances and really promote this idea of artistic fragrances. And it's, it's what we've been doing for, for two decades. It started with my father in another country, in the Middle East, actually, in Kuwait. Right. And so when I was you know, being trained as an architect and I worked a little bit, I kind of had to jump into this field. I, I'm not sure I definitely would have if, mm. you know, if that family situation wasn't presented to me. Right. And so I think from, you know, in my, from, for me personally, the creative part came in, and I heard this actually a couple of weeks ago and I really liked it. It came in designing the company yeah. rather than designing the fragrance. Yeah. And I, it took me literally 10 years to be, let, I don't want to say at peace with it, but to understand that there is a creative part to designing your life and designing your company and designing totally. your culture, yeah. which I found fascinating. I never thought about that. I always thought design was a very more tangible thing, like a product or, or a fragrance. And so there is, you know, as a summary, I can say there's no question that I would be 
nowhere near the success that I found without my architecture training. Not even close. Right. Not right. even close. That's so interesting. And, and it was, I noted, you know, you, you talked about fragrance and, and it's so often, you know, I think people fudge it a bit and, and talk about the creative process as though they are the, you know, the perfumer or, or the sort of originator of some of these things. And I think, it, you know, it's, there's so many different elements to creating a perfume anyway, all of which, as you know, you know, with, with the distribution company, it's all important to get something in front of a consumer, you know, right from the soil to the to sort of shop floor and everyone plays their part, but it's, it's sometimes a bit disingenuous, isn't it? Where people kind of slightly kind of cloud the issue of, oh, who actually created it? And of course, you know, there's a, there's a, a different and very technical art form in perfumery and the sort of the scientific chemistry nature of it. And um, yeah, and it sounds and like with... And artistic, and artistic. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. I would say that someone like me and very often, and we're not all in the same boat, there are many niche artisanal brands that the owners are actually mixing fragrances. So let's start there. But let's say half, you would consider me as the, as the art director, yeah. essentially. Yeah, I, yeah. It's, I'm the editor of, of this and I'm bringing my vision of how I'd like fragrances to to smell and to be and to experiment with and so on and so forth. And so I would say that if if you're going to think about me and what my position is, I'm the editor, ed- editor in chief of, of fragrances, um, utilizing very very talented perfumers. And that's important too, because ultimately someone has to make the final decision, and that's a mix of I suppose of you know an artistic sense, or but also there's there's commercial imperatives involved in that too, isn't there? Well, I mean, I think we can have a whole discussion about art as well, but I think the hardest thing you can give an architect or an artist or anybody is a completely blank page. They can't even, they can't even start. Yeah, you know? It's, yeah, it's yeah. really, really difficult. Yeah. So the editor or the client or the patron or whatever you want to call the person that's working with an artist, those restrictions, those challenges... Even myself, by the way, I, even as a brand, I was having a fight with one, not a fight, but a, but a debate with a retailer. And I'm like, they don't know what they're talking about. And I know what I'm talking about. And they pushed, pushed, pushed. And at the end, I had to apologize. I'm like, you know, you pushing me made this product better. And I was cursing along the way, of course, right? And so <laughs> this goes down the chain. I'm sure perfumers curse, but, but it's the challenge that we give them that probably produces results that may not have happened. If they weren't being pushed, well, it's funny. I think you deal with um, Tamin as well. Do you as a yes as one of your yeah? So I was at an event last night with with Christopher, and and again, it's just interesting. It was always interesting to to meet people, and actually, Christopher's been on the, the podcast before as well. But um, yeah, there's there's always a person that's going to either come up with the ideas in the first place and and find someone to interpret that in terms of the the, the fragrance itself. And I think that's it's equally important because someone has to make the kind of the final call, I suppose. Sure. Christopher is an ideal challenger. I mean, I know him very well. Yes. That's, that's, <laughs> it's made me think of him. I, I, yeah, I can <laughs> imagine how he is with a, a perfumer and there is that sort of push and pull and that yes. and that challenge, which is, as you say, in the end, perhaps makes something better. And a good perfumer does appreciate it. Yeah. When we're not just talking about, oh, I have to make it cheaper and I have to make it, you know, not about sales, but in, in, in Christopher's, I don't know exactly what he talks about, but he, he's very uh, conceptual. He's very yeah. emotional in, in yeah. the types of uh, direction that he gives to perfumers. Mine could be a bit more practical, maybe a little bit different, but mm. I know that perfumers appreciate the banter, the, a good banter back and forth. I think for, for, for a lot of well, us who... I hope they do. I'm, yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. They, <laughs> but I, yeah, I'm on, I guess, on the outside as a, you know, as a writer and a, a podcast and everything. And, but the thing that I love in, in this industry is, is always that sort of interplay and, and um, the communication between those, those different people. And it does seem like a... Well, I, I'm sure there's challenges like every industry, but, but that communication piece, I think, is, is so interesting. You're dealing with creative people that and you know it's um it's a joyful thing to work on isn't it it's not like we're some down coal mines or anything like yeah. that and i think what's great even here you know on your podcast i think if you went if you rewinded time to 30 years ago people didn't even know perfumers existed you know they thought that let's say you know if tommy hilfiger is making a fragrance they think tommy hilfiger he did making, it yeah he did it <laughs> and no offense but he's you know he's not i'm not and so on and, yeah. and i think the beauty of the last decade is that perfumers have been brought into the forefront a little bit more. Absolutely. I'm sure they can, I'm sure they, they 
feel they want more and they deserve more, but it's, it's a huge progress from, from where it was 20 years ago. They didn't exist they, you know, 20 years ago in the consumer's mind, in the consumer's yeah, mind, yeah. they didn't exist. So today when you, you know, when a brand launches, they, they indicate who the perfumers they're working yeah, with are. Yeah. So that's, that's a big step forward. It is. And I suppose with a lot of the brands that you work with, it's become much more important, probably less so still with some of the designer fragrances. But yeah, it's a, me as a journalist, it's often the first question you ask, isn't it? Oh, who, you know, who, who's yes, working on this? And exactly. Because there's a provenance and they've done other things. And we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about commodity in a second. But um, as always on the podcast, I like to ask my guests about their morning and evening routines and whether there are certain products that you use. Um, so I'd love to know from you, Vic, and yeah, do you, do you have a kind of set routine? Do you have, is it kind of an extensive thing that you do in the morning in terms of bathroom products or, or fairly simple? I wouldn't say extensive. And I'm assuming you're talking beyond the regular brushing my teeth and not, yeah. <laughs> beyond, yeah. the, beyond the hygienic stuff, I'm, I'm assuming. Yes. Yeah, I, it's, it's yeah. true. Yeah, Let's take that as a kind of a table yes. stake and a given that um, Vic so and brush cleans my his teeth. teeth. Yeah. I do brush my teeth Thank and I shave. That. Well, since this is a podcast and there's no cameras on, on people's phones, let's describe me, first of all, because it's yeah. important, right? So I'm Armenian. They will get important. to see a picture, though. So Oh, um, they do. Okay, fine. Yeah, so, a, so there's lots of hair. I'm Armenian. Um, <laughs> so lots of hair. Lots of hair. Um, and it's been actually a battle of mine, believe it or not, and, and, and for most Armenians. So I hear you. Um, I totally hear you on this. Just yeah. hair everywhere. Hair, hair everywhere. Um, mm. And so... Well, I'm going to answer your question. Is it, There's a routine, but it's not extensive. I have a right. minor routine, and I'll let you ask away. Okay, so are there are there certain sort of shower products you like? Do you, do you go so far as skincare with, you know, moisturizers, toners, things like that? I mean, really just this, this whatever you do before you, you know, as you're getting ready, are there are certain things that you're loyal to or, or you just try different stuff? I guess you've got the benefit of having a, a company where you can probably get access to some of these kind of products. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, our, our company in Kuwait distributes La Prairie. So we have these thousand dollar <sighs> caviars that I, that I don't use and, and so on, just so you know. Yeah. And so my, believe it or not, the funniest part of my routine is it's really quite simple. I like to be shaven all the time. Yep. Mostly because my family will refuse to get anywhere near me if I'm not shaven. So... <laughs> My, I have two daughters. They won't kiss me goodnight. They right. just will, you know, reject me like the plague if I'm not shaven. And do you use a, a wet shaver, Vic, or do you go electric? Or? No, 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 no electric. I use a, uh, a shaving soap, which I yep. like very much. So I like a very thin layer. I don't do the big foam. Mm -hmm. In fact, I haven't used foam in two decades, probably. And once you use like a thin layer of shaving soap, you really can't go back to foam. And then you can see what you're doing a bit better. You can you? see what you're doing. I learned how to shave. I don't know what her name is at this point, but there's a company called eShave, which was, uh, right. which came out at the same time as the art of shaving. And when we used to do trade shows together in, in, in America 20 years ago, I was like, Hey, right. can you, what's the proper way? And then they taught me, you don't go against the hair, you go with the grain. And they kind of taught me how to shave. That's and really cool though, to have a, have a proper tutorial like that. Yeah. Pretty simple, you know, yeah. pretty simple. Pores have to be open. You have to shave with the grain of the hair, not against it. People think if you go against it, you're getting sharper. Yeah, it's yeah. not. And a really sharp blade and a really thin layer of soap. This is mm. kind of it. I mean, there isn't much else. I don't, have a, I don't have a beard, so I don't know about trimming and all that kind of stuff, but clean shave is, is critical. I don't have any specific moisturizers that I use in terms of brand. It's mm -hmm. a moisturizer. Now, I don't use anything with SPF. And you everybody don't. else should. Mm. I don't <laughs> because I Why like not, to get a, because I like to get a little color. So that's okay. the problem. So, so I okay. don't like the skin cancer part of it, but I like the color part of it. And so, right, I know I should use something with SPF, but I don't. And my sister's a sister in law is a dermatologist. On top of that, is she? <laughs> yes, she is. Does she nag you to put some SPF? She on? does. She yeah. does. She does. Uh, well, and she zaps me, so that helps. You know, so okay. when I. Can, I so I don't use SPF. I get the sunspots. Then I go to her and she zaps them off, which is not what anybody should be doing. Right. How often would you go and do that? Mm, well, I just, I'm 52 now. So I just started about two years ago. So once a year, I zap. Okay. Oh no, once every two years, probably. I zap a couple of little sunspots off. Right, okay. She has this light that she shows. I don't know, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it's like an infrared light that shows yeah. your face, what it looks like, the real sunspots. It looks like the constellation as if you're looking up in the sky at night. Yeah. And it's, it's crazy when you see that. 
Wow. Despite all of those suggestions, I still don't use SPF on my face on a regular basis. I do use it when I go to the beach, just to be right. clear. Just to be clear. And then the last and very interesting thing is that I used for many years, many, many years, a tinted, uh, what do you call it? A tinted gel. Did you? What, I did. So I'm kind of, again, being Armenian, I'm, I'm kind of, Armenians could be olive skinned and they could be pale or dark, right? Yeah. You, uh, by nature. I have this unusual, like, I don't know, olive light skin. And so in the winter, I feel like I look like a, a petrified corpse, right? And so when I used to do these events in the stores, I'm like, I gotta, I gotta, you know, I got a bit of color. I gotta get a bit of color. <laughs> and, I found, and I found this product from, um, I'm trying to remember how far back it goes. I think it was Tom Ford or something uh -huh. before that. So it's an Estee Lauder product. It's called Healthy Glow Gel. Right. And I used it and I used it and just put a little on your finger. You know, I moisturize my face to get it yeah. like nice and smooth. And then you put the gel on and it, it gives you a little bit of color. And nice. then that company closed and then Clinique took it over. So Clinique has it now, um, healthy looking gel. Do you, do you buy it now, Vicky, or not? I still use, well, <laughs> I changed. Yeah. So I use something else now. Right. Shall I tell you what it is? Please do. So that healthy looking gel, or it's by Clinique, has a, sorry, I'm thinking, it has a, like a, a little bit of a color, like a little bit of a brown yeah. color. It yeah, gives yeah, you yeah. a little bit of a tan looking thing. So, while I was buying Commodity, I was researching some other brands. I've always been fascinated in men's makeup, believe it or not. Not makeup like lipstick, just yeah. facial products, right? No, I get it. Yeah. So this company came up called Strix. I think it's S-T-R-Y-X. Okay. And they had this men's, I'm going to say foundation, but it's yeah. a men's, they call it, I don't know, lotion with a tinted lotion or tinted Tint, yeah. moisturizer yeah. or something like that. But basically, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a foundation, which... Yeah. Let's say men don't want to like say. Like a sort of BB cream kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. but it's very transparent. So I bought it. I was just like seeing what it's about. And I, I just put like, I'm telling you, it's a little, tiny little squirt and over the face and all those sunspots kind of get evened out in the right. morning. You can't tell I have it. It just makes it look a little bit more like on Zoom, you know, when the camera is fuzzy and you can't <laughs> yeah. see me very well. That's what it does uh, on an everyday right. basis. That's about it. Now, there's a whole other conversation about hair, but... I'm no, I'm interested. Mic, I'm, in, I'm so interested. I'll, what, do, have you got a certain, is there a certain product you like or a range of things you put in your hair? So first things first, I've wanted to shave my head for a very long time. Really? Yes. Because that's how aggravating my, my hair problem is. And everybody's like, you're insane. You know, <laughs> a, a vast majority of men are losing their hair and here yeah. I am complaining about my hair. So I'm not, I'm not, going up yeah, I mean, I'm, not, I'm not complaining, but keeping down this massive thing, okay, is oh, so your, pro your problem is too much of it then, you think? It's just too much. It's just too much volume. And <laughs> I have to put all this product in and to keep it down. And so, yeah, I mean, what am I looking for? The, and I have a million of these. I'm looking for a matte, because I hate the way like greasy hair looks. So yeah, I'm looking yeah. for a matte, super hold, like pomade, wax, mm -hmm. gel, whatever you want to call it. So I buy one every month and, you know, I rotate, but... That's my hair problem, is that I have too much of it. And you haven't found, it doesn't sound like you found the ideal product in all this rotating of new ones. I did. It's like a combination of things, you know, I... I, I Make your own cocktail of Yeah, it's like a gel first and then a pump out after 10 minutes and then a little bit of hairspray wow. 15 minutes after that. But who wants to do that, to do that every morning? That sounds quite a, yeah, I'm quite a thing. You, yeah, so yeah, wait, yeah. so this summer, I got to keep going to this story. You can cut it out if you want, but it's fascinating. No, 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 it's good. So, so again, I love my family. So they said, if you ever shave your head, don't come home, right? So <laughs> You can't have a beard and you can't have a shaved head. I can't, exactly. They yeah. don't want hair in one place, but they want hair. <laughs> so, um, so I've had my hair being cut by the same individual for 26 years, okay? His name is Robert. Right. And um, I said, Robert, we're going to do something. I said, every time you cut my hair now, I want you to go a little shorter and a little shorter. So during the summer, we so between May and July, we got it down to like, right now my hair, if I open it, you know, if I let it out of its cage, <laughs> it's probably like three inches long. So for the Europeans, what is that? Like two centimeters? No, four, no, more. five centimeters, yeah, six centimeters, right? Yeah. Six centimeters. So I got it down to almost half an inch, like really almost military cut. Yeah. I can't tell you how happy I was. I'd get out of bed, 
and I would do nothing. Didn't have to do anything to it. I mean, I brush my teeth, shave my face. Good, good. And that's it. And it was amazing. And I'm going to do it again next week. I can't take this anymore. But um, how did the family feel about the, the shorter buzz cut? You know, they're like, yeah, it looks good. We like it longer. And I don't care anymore. I'm doing it without. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. You know, thinking about commodities as well, um, are there plans... Well, probably I don't, for later this year or early next. Are there some new things in, in the pipeline for the brand? Of course. Um, I mean, from a fragrance point of view, there'll always be new fragrances, right? So we're launching a really exciting new fragrance, uh, t- probably two fragrances next year. Okay. Uh, kind of a main major one in the middle of the year and then a special edition at the end of the year. So I want to, what the special edition basically is, are fragrances that I don't think may have international appeal but I like them. So I just right. want to do it. It's like, it's my party. I can do what I want to type of thing. So I'll just do a, I'll do like a special edition. I'll put it out sort there. Of limited make, run kind of thing. Yeah. If you like it, you buy it. Yeah. If you don't, you don't kind of thing. They're, yeah, they're my, nice. they're my experiments essentially. And so, um, so there'll be a major one, which I hope will be internationally accepted. And then a more personal one towards the end of the year. And then we're of course, jumping into other categories. We're, we're really trying to develop a home kind of a candle collection. Great. In the same spirit as as scent space, you know, about how much space you want your candle to occupy. How do you want the whole room, your whole house? Yeah. Do you want it just to flicker without any you know, without any um scent? Yeah. Some people some people don't like it. They just want the appearance of it. And so I think there's something there that we have to experiment with. Um, it makes a lot of sense for the brand, doesn't it? All the things you've said, it's moving yeah. into the home space. Absolutely. And so we're we're working on that. And then we're trying to open a retail store in New York sometime soon. And Are you? A lot of stuff going on. Wow. And your relationship with, I, I didn't really sort of finish on fragrance, Vicken, but in terms of the, the end of your routine and the fact that you've got access to, you know, all the these amazing brands that you represent as well as commodity, do you become like the sort of pizza chef that doesn't want to eat pizza? Or do you still enjoy fragrance and, and try different things every day? What, what's your relationship with fragrance on a personal level? Okay, so we were building a house for ourselves um, oh, yeah. last year, a house unrelated mm. to fragrance. <laughs> and the guy who was building the house, okay, he's sneezing all day long, right? He's cutting the wood, you know, you frame a house and... yeah. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? He's like, I, I'm allergic. To, <laughs> I'm allergic to, to wood. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, I'm allergic <laughs> to wood. I'm like, you're building a house and you're what? allergic. Yeah, that's his profession. He's allergic to the cedar, not cedar. It's whatever, whatever the particular wood is. Yeah. He's allergic to the wood. That's Believe it or not, my relationship with fragrance is really unusual. Is that I'm also allergic to certain fragrances. Are you? What would, would it would make you sneeze or bring you in a rash? Or? Well, since this is about looking in the mirror and yeah. talking about per- personal stuff, we're going to keep yeah. going, right? So my nose, I'm a very proud Armenian nose. It's my turn, it's big, and but it's quite narrow. And uh-huh. so I have a breathing problem, believe it or not. See you. I do. And, you know, I should probably take care of it. And believe it or not, the reason why I, have, I don't take care of it is because they'll have to alter my nose and I don't want to. I love my crooked yeah. nose, actually. Right? They'll have to so fix it. So it would change the the shape of it. And a little, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. A little bit. So it's problematic where my nose is is a problem. But I love my crooked nose. It's my identity, and I don't want to change it. And so certain notes, and I'm going to actually investigate this this year. They, I don't sneeze. I don't do anything. They they congest me. I become congested. I can't breathe. They right. close up my my passageways even more. And they happen to be florals, actually. And there's a whole story about that. But a lot of kind of the classic white flowers and the jasmines and the gardenias, mm-hmm. they, cause, they, they cause a problem for me. And so I can't really wear that much fragrance. And, right. and that's what you'll find in, in commodity, believe it or not. There's a lot of woods going on. Yeah. There there's is. a, lot of, a yeah. lot of gourmands going on. Yeah. There's very little florals going on. That's true. That's really why. It has to do with my crooked nose. <laughs> Believe it or not. There you go. And so I don't wear it all day. I do wear it on occasion. And it's bittersweet because I love it, yeah. obviously. But I can't yeah. enjoy it. Yeah. I can't enjoy it as much. And in, in, in terms of the commodity range, do you do you view it like a sort of benevolent father or are you allowed to have a sort of favorite that you would pick out? Or are they all your favorite children? No, of course. I, I you know, I tell my daughters which, which one I like better. <laughs> <laughs> People say they like all their kids the same. I'm like, no, They're I liars. like one better than the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They can guess. They can guess which one that is. <laughs> what do I like the best? Uh, I like velvet the best. 
as my fragrance. But let me tell you, it's the worst seller. Is out it? Of the, out of the six, it's the, number, yeah. it's the sixth one. And then I like Paper Bold as the second best one. And that's probably the second worst seller. There's a pattern here. Exactly. <laughs> so why do I like it is the question. For me, Velvet is a very distinct fragrance. Yeah. And I like I liked distinctness. Like moss is a great fragrance, but it's easy. It's nice. It's easy to wear and, you know, it smells good. It's fine. It's whatever. But I think if you're trying to make a statement with a brand, mm. it's okay to have the fragrances that are acceptable and good and just pleasant. But it also is necessary to have fragrances that are distinct. I mean, I think milk is distinct, by the way. Yeah. I think gold has a distinction. But for me personally, I really, really like velvet as one of my one of my favorites in the collection. I think it's great. And it's funny, you mentioned milk feels like that. I know you've, you know, the fragrance has been there for a while, but it's funny how they sort of, sometimes these different notes come in and out of fashion, strangely, don't they? Suddenly this seems to sort of coalesce around a certain ingredient or a note, but I know it feels like milk is, <laughs> milk having a moment, how ridiculous. But, you know, as a, as a kind of note on a, yeah, it feels like that, that milk fragrance is, it, there's certainly here in the UK, I seem to be seeing it a lot on social media and just the that, what a great scent it is and, you know, that kind of your own skin but slightly better and that, that sort of milky note. It's, I've seen it in a few different fragrances, but certainly in the, in the commodity fragrance, milk is it's, it's beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, it's become our best seller. It's, it's the How one we it? launched. Yeah, we, we launched that. So the rest of the fragrances, gold, book, paper, and um, velvet, moss, all, all of those existed before. Mm -hmm. uh, what we bought it. And of course we had to make our mark and start our, you know, start our own journey on the brand. And milk was our first creation actually. And we didn't, you're right. There is the trend, but it, we either it's subconscious or, or whatever. It didn't really, the creation of that product did not start by us saying we want electronic milky fragrance. No. And yeah, I think that just, would be the road to kind of madness, wouldn't it? To try and anticipate some of these things. I guess sometimes it's a, happy accident almost that you, you've got a fragrance that's happening at the right time. But I guess by the time you would develop and test and get something to market, if, it, if you were trying to jump on a bandwagon, you'd be too late, wouldn't you, on these things, I guess? Of course. I mean, for example, we work with f perfume companies, right? So we don't, again, we don't make our fragrances. We yeah. work with very talented yeah. companies. Yeah. Those companies have their own trend watchers. I'm doing yeah. air quotes here, right? <laughs> so, so they come to us, they're like, you know, we think this is where the next direction should be. And I can tell you with that question, every single one, because we're developing a new fragrance right now, they've all suggested a pistachio fragrance. Mm. Well, yeah, pistachio is trending right now, but by yeah. the time I do it and come out with it, it's gonna, it's gonna. <laughs> yeah, they're be, out now. There's a few out now, isn't there? So there is exactly, and yeah. they're good, and they're all different take. But I, you shouldn't do a fragrance for the sake of following the trend. I think, I think what happened with milk. You know, the funny story I, I always tell is, years ago I was watching a documentary about fashion designers, and I forgot who it was, but uh, the interviewer was asking this designer whether it was Vera Wang or whoever it was, how do you feel about this trend or this this issue, let's say, where in a season, all these designers are doing the same thing all of a sudden, right? The mm. same kind of thing. Like this year, it's about, you know, purple velvet. And, yeah. and she said, you know, and this, she's like, it, it really is not like we have a spy in the other designers, you know, atelier or their, their studio. It just kind of happens. People are there's like chatter maybe, or there's some yeah. kind of subconscious direction. Something in the air. Something in the air. And <laughs> And then, then the fashion fashion week happens and you notice there's 10 people with purple purple fur. It really was exactly like that with milk. It could be sub subconscious. Maybe we subconsciously kept seeing it and we called it milk, but it really wasn't started that way. It's not yeah. like the pistachio example where I think we should go and make a pistachio fragrance type of thing. It just kind of happened uh, uh, happily. Well, it's absolutely beautiful. Um, and the name of the podcast, Vic, and actually uh, it feels like within the conversation you've been very open about appearance and, and some of the things about your appearance anyway. But I like to ask, as the name of the podcast is Man in the Mirror, what you think about the man that looks back at you when, you know, when, when you're in the bathroom mirror in the morning, you know, you're 52. Do, do you, yeah, how do you feel about what looks back at you? You mean, do I like what I see? Yeah. Yeah. And I guess, you know, some people, <laughs> but some people take it kind of on the purely sort of visual superficial level or, or or how you know go as deep as you like how do you feel about the the man the man, the man. um well let's start on the superficial level because you know we're all vain at the end of the day <laughs> exactly it is what it is i'm fine i'm you know i the people around me that love me love me that's kind of what matters um 
it is important that we do our best to maintain our best self. I do believe in that, mm. whatever that means. Like it has nothing to do with like weight or mm. how much hair you have or whatever, but it is important, you know, we have an obligation to each other to, to all put our best foot forward in, in whatever that is, whether it's physical or mental or, 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 um, or attitude. But in terms of what I see as a person, I'm pre, you know, I do, I try to live my life with really um, strict set of moral and ethical guidelines. Right. And so I don't regret much in terms of, you know, in terms of the past, um, mm -hmm. I should have done this or I should have been there with better yeah. for this friend or I don't have that many of those because I really, I have this philosophy where I prefer to lose 10 friends if I'm going to do right by one of them and that's the right thing to do. And, and that's yeah. helped me kind of through life a lot. There is more I'd like to do because I'm not really into success for the sake of success. Meaning, you know, the, the difference between a struggle living paycheck to paycheck and and not is not actually a huge amount. You don't need millions of dollars to, to be comfortable. You know, you yeah. just need a, a home food and whatever. Yeah. So once yeah. you've reached that, you know, for, I'm wearing a t-shirt, I'm wearing jeans and Adidas sneakers. It's really enough for me, honestly speaking, but I'm driven mm -hmm. to do more. I haven't yet figured out what the big picture is in terms of more than making fragrance, making money. I, I think I'd like to figure that out still. I have some ideas. We do a lot of philanthropy, but- right. So a sort of bigger, a bigger purpose. Yeah, a little, a little bit yeah. bigger purpose. Um, I haven't quite yet figured that out, but mm. maybe if you interview me again next year, I will. <laughs> and, and are you someone that's? Uh, do, do you do? Are you into fitness? Is that a big part of your life? You're kind of someone that works out or cycles or anything. Have you found a thing that really sort of helps you in terms of mindfulness and exercise? So, yes, actually, I said that I don't have much regrets. The one regret I do have is that I didn't start working out until I was 40, mm. like midlife crisis time, right? So at 40, I started, and, and my whole family, my wife included, everybody started doing it. Um, and I wish I had done it earlier. I mean, it's right. good that the generation today that's in the 20s is already built into their kind of, yeah. you know, to their DNA already, but... Totally. I wish, I wish I'd started when I was younger. So I do go to a trainer twice a week. Okay. It's an investment that's well, well worth it or else mm. I definitely wouldn't go. Do you enjoy I, it when you're there? Or is it ooh, does anybody enjoy it? Does anybody no. ever answer that question that they enjoy well, it? <laughs> there is people that sort of seem to love the pain and I, I always think it's better at the end, isn't it, once it's done? But I go to the gym at 7 a.m., the happiest moment is 7.59 when I'm done. When it's done, okay. yeah, exactly. So, so and then no you happy. feel that achievement that you've actually done it and got through it. <laughs> exactly. So I do yeah. it twice a week. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a dread. Who wants to wake up at six and have their coffee and then drive? And I have to figure out all my clothes before I get to the gym so I can get to the gym and I can get dressed. And then you have like one blue sock and one black sock because you're getting, you know, you're preparing your clothes at 5 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. And so, but the regret is I wish I'd start earlier. Right. It's really, really so important. And eating correctly. And I think people can maybe relate during COVID. So during COVID, many people started cooking at home. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget like five months after it started when I had my first meal, takeout meal from a restaurant. I'm telling you, my body was rejecting it. There's like alarms going off. Like, what is this foreign stuff you've yeah. put into my yeah. body? I remember where I was sitting and I remember what I was eating. And it wasn't anything. It was like chicken parm. It was not... You know, it wasn't like anything Double nuts. burger or anything. Yeah, it wasn't <laughs> nuts. And it, the body felt a clear distinction between home cooking, low oil, low yeah. grease, low everything. And low additives and all that low stuff. Low additives versus mm. fried foods. And um, that's the most difficult thing is really controlling the... It's harder to control the, for me the eating proper than to go to the gym and... and which is difficult enough to commit mm. to going to work out. But to really eat properly... You have to think about it because there's so many times your friends want to go out at night or you're at a meeting, yeah. business meeting at lunch and some, you know, something's going on where it doesn't allow you to eat properly. I yeah, think you must have quite a sociable, I mean, th the work must be a sociable thing and that there's meals with clients and colleagues and things like that. You, you kind of navigate that and make, is it easy to make the right kind of choices? You must be out quite a lot. Well, you? On top of that, my company is called Euro Perfumes. So it's all European suppliers. Yeah. So it's, it's wine and steak yeah. and with every single meal, it's a killer. Like my heart is 
<laughs> jumping out of my chest after, 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 and some butter and some bread. I mean, but yeah. it's so, tastes so good. It's really good hard stuff. to. Yeah, if you're in France, in the south of France, I mean, so, or oh, Italy, there's so much good food. And Yeah, when in Rome, right? Exactly, yeah. That's the problem. <laughs> and the final thing, Vic, and I ask every guest is the things that make them happy. What, what are the things that bring you joy? I mean, multiple things. Family, mm-hmm. without question. I mean, that's, uh, you know, a text message from your child. People don't realize how, <laughs> what, a, what an important thing that is. And anybody who, yeah. who understands, understands, yeah. or doesn't, doesn't. How old are your kids, Vic? 21 and, and 19. Oh, okay. So are they at home or have they left no, no, their college both and in, stuff? They're both in university. Yeah. So of course, family. And then the, the pain of entrepreneurship, I've always said it brings me happiness. It's the worst if it's boring and stagnant. So, yeah. you know, the problems and... Not the you problems. like it when it's this stuff yeah. going on to fix. Yes, and- yeah. So any, like, for example, if I go to the warehouse and the warehouse is empty... I'm angry that it's empty. Why is there no product that we can't sell? Yeah, if yeah. I go to the warehouse and it's full, I'm angry. Why is it full? <laughs> why is no one buying it? <laughs> why are we selling anything? So, and then, I, you know, it's just part of, you know, that's part of, I'm not angry at someone. I'm just mentally like, we should be selling more or we should be buying more. Or it's just never yeah, satisfied. Yeah, yeah. And then my personal life, you know, painting and being on my tractor up in the mountains are very important to me. Ah. Uh-huh. You're, mm-hmm. you're paint, what kind of stuff do you paint? I attempt to paint, let's put it that way. What a lovely thing to do, though. Yeah. But isn't it interesting? I mean, we're probably at a similar stage of life. And I think it's it's a good thing, isn't it, to to have these external interests and, and ways of making your mind work in different ways other than just the kind of regular job and the stuff you do. I think it's quite important. I I joined a choir actually last year. Wow. And so me and my wife go to this choir and they do, you know, it's like pop songs and stuff. But But actually, it isn't the it's just the fact of being with people and, and doing something different and meeting people that I don't normally meet in my social circle and doing this thing together. And it's, yeah, it's a really joyous thing. But whatever the thing is, that that idea of just trying to keep learning new things or new skills, and I, I love that. Yeah, and, and look, it's 100% personal, but for those who are listening who are busy with work and, and mm. you know, building a company or whatever they're doing, it's actually for the health of the company. Nobody right. wants a maniac of a boss, which we can all be. And so yeah. it's really important that we take care of ourselves. Yeah, and take time um, away. And by the way, the one hour drive to the city, um, so I'm in New Jersey, I have to drive to the city. In that one hour drive, you're reflecting about your work. Mm. When you're there painting and whatever, you're reflecting. On the drive, you know, it's really, really, really critical. It's really a business investment, believe it or not. No, as I well as totally as well as that. a as well as a personal investment. Oh, brilliant. Dick, and thank you so much for your time. It's been fascinating to hear more about commodity and and your life. And um, yeah, look, really appreciate it. And I'm gonna put links to some of the products you mentioned and of course where people can find out more about the commodity range, which I heartily recommend that they do. But um, we'll see you again soon. Thank you so much. Thank and, you. And um, thanks for your time. Amazing. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Massive thanks to Vikan for joining me on the podcast all the way from the States. Yeah, really interesting conversation. And I, I think I think you could tell from that how how driven and how passionate Vikan is about the business, both both commodity and the, the distribution company he has. And obviously it's kind of almost in the blood, I think, as, as a, a family thing. I, I was also struck by, actually, at first I wasn't sure, how, you know, uh, how many products he was going to talk about and wh- wh- what kind of regime he had. But actually, it was probably one of the more interesting and, and extensive um, regimes, you know, particularly talking about the kind of the sort of tinted gel that, that goes on the face and uh, how he talked about his hair and uh, how he wanted to have it and uh, what his family thought about that. So really, really enjoyed chatting to Vicken and... Um, if you get the chance to check out the commodity fragrances, you should do. I know they do a great discovery set, so you can sample some of the, the different fragrances. Um, and they're certainly available here in the UK and, of course, internationally. If you want to find out 
more about the brand, um, it's commodityfragrances.com and at commodity on Instagram. And um, yeah, I really recommend you check out their their fragrance range. If you want to find out more about Man in the Mirror, you can do. I'm at Man in the Mirror Pod on Instagram, and that's where you'll find information about previous guests and this little sound snippets and there's little clips and um yeah and i'll also tease what's coming up on future episodes so thanks as always for for joining me i really appreciate it and if you are able to subscribe and to leave a review it would be amazing thanks to vicken for joining me and thanks to you as always and i'll see you next time on man in the mirror take care 